You're listening to The Voice of the Arts, WQED-FM. I'm Jim Cunningham. Rebecca Diaz is here. We're going to talk about two terrific events. Rebecca is the Director of Community Engagement and Idea Initiatives at Pittsburgh Opera. She's the founder and principal consultant, Diaz Inclusion Consulting. I cannot believe we have not met until this (laughs) moment because you've been doing so many great things. We have an event, Opera Meets Jazz, on April 5, 7 o'clock. And we'll have the resident artists gathering with jazz luminaries from the Afro-American Music Institute. We're going to be talking about Mary Cardwell Dawson's life, and some of her favorite arias are included in that. And then we have a panel discussion, which is happening on Sunday, April 14th, 2 p.m. at the Bits Opera Factory. And it's a great panel discussion. The passion of Mary Cardwell Dawson is at the center of it. Thomas Douglas, Shauna McGill, uh, I'll run down the list with uh, Rebecca in just a moment. Rebecca, we'll start with the opera meets jazz. Can you compress all the good essential elements of this happening? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a really great event. And what I love about this event is that we're showing that music, no matter what kind of music you like, if you like jazz, opera, classical, Broadway, pop music, there's a way to kind of codify that um, because it's all music. And so that's at the heart of this event where we've we've partnered up here with the Afro-American Music Institute with Dr. J um, with his wife and all their great musicians to to take what they do so well, which is their jazz, and what we do so well, which is our opera, and kind of, um, you know, go back and forth between where do those arias fit in? Where do we see a combination of either the theme or of the style of music, and how does it relate to each other? Um, in fact, we're going to end that, that showcase with a really great rendition of Summertime, um, both in the jazz version of that and in the classical version, to kind of see where things coalesce. Really fun event. It's going to be in Homewood at the um, St. James Church. Great little reception afterwards, um, hosted by Rue Orleans. So if you want to come get some really great, inspired New Orleans treats after that event, it's really worth it coming down for, for both, I think. And that church is where the Afro-American Music Institute began. Yes, yes, I believe so. It's on 10th, uh, 10th Street down there in um, Historic in building. Yeah, it's really beautiful. If you really haven't beautiful. been there, that's a good reason yeah, to go alone. Yeah, certainly. Now, it's free. It is free, yes. Everything that we do uh, in terms of community events in, in Pittsburgh Opera are always free for everybody. Who should come? Everybody should come to this event, I think. So this is certainly for any music lover. Um, Like I said, it's not terribly long. It's about an hour in length. So if you want to test the waters to see if you enjoy opera, if you've never really listened to it before, it's a great way to come in and try it out for the first time. In reverse, if you've never really had a lot of jazz experience, a great way to come in there and and dip your toe in the jazz waters. So it's a nice, I think, intro experience for anybody to come. Children, adults, anybody in between should all check it out. And you mentioned some of the music will be music that Mary Cardwell Dawson would would know and love. Yes, so Mary Carmel Dawson really focused a lot on grand opera during her time, which was a very big deal because she did a lot of her own fundraising from these grassroots initiatives, and we all know that grand opera is crazy expensive. So it was really remarkable to see this dedication she had to grand opera. So we've got a, a few really familiar, well-known grand opera pieces um, in this this performance. I don't want to give it all away, but for instance, Quando Menvo is one of our um, arias we'll be doing, of course, from La Boheme, one of the most famous operas of all time. And uh, it's going to actually kind of really nicely uh, fit into a, a surprising jazz piece that I, I won't give it away. You got to come and see it for yourself and oh, see how you that got works me going out. Now that's great. Yeah, it'll be really neat. Mary Cardwell Dawson. Twenty years ago, her name was almost completely forgotten yes. here in Western Pennsylvania, but her star has been on the rise <laughs> here and nationally. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Interestingly enough, we have we've had two kind of really great um, women behind getting getting her name out there. And one of them locally here is Janae Solomon, um, who is the the owner and kind of the the catalyst behind the National Opera House as it is now with reparations happening to to the house. And of course, Denise Graves and her foundation, um, who is behind the, this piece, The Passion of Mary Cabell Dawson, and really has done a, like the lion's share of work in getting her name out there and getting everyone to know about her. I thought it was fascinating that Mary Cardwell sometimes did things outdoors. She wasn't yes. always inside. Yes, yes. In fact, one of the big stories of her life is that she uh, was putting an opera on a barge in the middle of the river and in, um, in D.C. And uh, the challenges that come along with that. But anything she could do to kind of create access to her, her work was at the paramount of that, the, the head of that, because at the time, segregation was such a horrible reality that she couldn't always get into buildings to make things happen. And so being able to have that access to the outdoors was a, a double um benefit. You could get more people to hear what's going on and you could actually get it performed in the first place. It's hard to explain how huge her contribution was. During her day it was enormous. 
Yes, in fact, one of her big claims to fame uh, that isn't really talked about too much is that she was really a very big champion for um, desegregation. And so she had a lot of contacts here in Pittsburgh and was able to, for instance, get her orchestra to be one of the very, very few non-segregated orchestras in her productions. And she would teach children of all races to kind of get that love of opera. She would cast people of all races in the operas. And that really wasn't happening at the time. Of course, that's part of the plan of James Johnson and Pam at the yes. Africa, African American Music Institute. So it's all beautifully Absolutely. interwoven mm -hmm. here. That's how they got going with bringing people together, no matter what your background or color was. That's absolutely right. And what I also love about Dr. J and Pam is that they are so so prominent in jazz and such legendaries in the jazz community, but they have a lot of classical knowledge as well and are very trained classically. They understand the classical voice very well, which is why this partnership is so unique and so interesting because it isn't every day you find someone that is so supremely gifted in the jazz world but has a vast understanding of the classical world as well. And so Dr. it works out Dr. James nice. studied violin as an undergrad. That's right, yeah. Amazing yeah. guy. Okay, the specifics. Uh, who's appearing from the African American Music Institute? Do you know who's coming? James will be there? James will be there and his wife Pam will be singing. I um, know Anquini Kinzel will also be performing in this she's event. And too. she's lovely. And she'll be speaking a bit uh, to open the event about Mary Carwell Dawson um, and her legacy, um, both here locally and also nationally um, as well. Um, I have to check on the other singers they've got going on, but from our side, we have a few of our resident artists performing. Um, we have, let's see, Fran Daniel Lauserica is going to be singing. He's our tenor. Um, we have Jasmine, who is our mezzo-soprano. Brandon is our bass. And we have... Julia, who will be our soprano for that. And of course, Mark Trofka on the piano, and he's been arranging all these great pieces. So it's going to be a really nice lineup. This is all hands on deck. Oh, yes. It's oh, going yeah. to be an amazing happening. And how's your talk to music ratio? It's not going to be terribly talky. So it, it, we won't be boring you with too much uh, chatter, and it won't be a lecture recital for sure, a little opening, a little setup for each piece, but really focusing on the music here. I'm a talker. I'm fascinated <laughs> in every word, and I love all the music you're going to do. So what have we not mentioned about this event? We've got to get people to come. It's going to be wonderful. I really think you should come see this. Um, like I said, the, I think the beauty of this event is that it's it's a nice amount of time. You're not investing a, a huge chunk of your day. You're getting out in the community. You're meeting different people. We're going to have really great uh, combinations of individuals who are both both from the classical world and the jazz world, so it's a great time to come and socialize. We're leaving some ample time after the show so people can talk to each other. Um, a big focus of all these community events is the actual community. We want people to come out and meet each other and talk about what they care about and just start bridging those, those gaps between what we know and love and what we don't know we love yet. And so I think it's certainly worth coming out and checking it, uh, checking it out if you haven't been to anything before. And it's free, so why not? A topic fascinates me. This is the right time. Terrence Blanchard, fire shut, in, yes. shut up in mm -hmm. my bones. A huge hit, and he's coming to Pittsburgh and he's in a coming matter to Pittsburgh. of days. Yeah, I Who know. Who would believe it? Isn't it incredible? Yeah, well, with the uh, the eclipse coming through, I think we've all just had the stars aligned for some wonderful reason. But the, the, the topic of opera meets jazz, it's vast. It's all Gershwin, Blue Monday, yes. and mm -hmm. Ellington, Queenie Pie. There are all kinds of things. Yes. Some known, some completely unknown still. Yes, that's but right. But Mary Cardwell Dawson happening, and it's happening through Pittsburgh. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you're right about that. You know, there's always been a connection to jazz and opera, and I think only recent time we've forgotten about that. If we look back at the old singer standards of the time, so many of them were, were directly related to the operas that were happening because that was popular music. If we look at even the song um, Poor Butterfly, that's from um, that's based off Miss Saigon, uh, which is based off of Madame Butterfly. And so we've got these combinations of things and these connections that are there that are, are right under our noses if we just look for them. We forget sometimes the contributions of people like Leontine Price with mm -hmm. her crossover, if you want to call it that, yes. from gospel to yes. the opera world. E even Aretha Franklin singing oh, yeah. Nestle Dorma for Pavarotti at the Grammys. Isn't it? There's a <laughs> lot of... A lot of crossover. It's surprising. There certainly is. And a lot of opera singers, especially African-American opera singers, got their start in the church. A lot of them sang in the church choirs and sang gospel music. And gospel lends itself so well to a, a big, beautiful powerhouse instrument of the voice. There is so much support happening and use of the breath and the line legato to make those sounds in the first place that it really is a cousin to opera in a lot of ways. And it's a very easy pathway for many of these church singers to have gone from that 
into singing opera, and we see a lot of that today. It takes the same power and sophistication to sing gospel as it does to sing Wagner. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. We have another event to talk about. Yes. What is going on with your panel discussion? This is Sunday, April 14, 2 p.m. It's at the Bits Opera Factory, your world headquarters down yes. there in the Strip <laughs> District. Uh, it's an amazing panel right at the top. Thomas Douglas, who's in chief, the chief of uh, opera over at CMU, Bach Choir Pittsburgh, and director of opera studies, choral studies, you name it. Who else is on our list? So we've got Shauna McDill, who is the managing director of the Public Theater. Uh, and Shauna, if you don't know her, she was in the foundation world forever here in Pittsburgh and has uh, recently taken on the reins of running the Public Theater here in Pittsburgh. Uh, we've got Joanna Obuzar, who is the vice president of operations for the Cultural Trust here, the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. We have our own Claudia Brownlee, who is our costume director at Pittsburgh Opera. And of course, we can't forget Isaiah Winfrey, who is a fantastic makeup artist and professional stylist. He's worked on a lot of our productions um, doing makeup design for our, um, our operas that we have here at Pittsburgh Opera. And the reason this panel was so specifically chosen to ensure we had such a vast array of individuals is because one of Mary Carwell Dawson's big tenets in life was to ensure that the arts were accessible for everyone, not only on the stage, but behind the stage as well. How can we make sure there's job creation in the arts for anybody if they want to be a stage director or makeup or costume design or working for the opera or being the boss of the opera? How can we set those pathways set up? So everyone on this panel is a leader in their field. They're from different backgrounds, different types of theater, different types of performance, different types of creation, different ages and generations. But all of these people are black creatives who have become leaders in what they do. And they're really great at what they do. So we're hopeful that we'll get to learn about how they got where they got. What was challenging? What was a success? How can people here listening to these stories learn from this and hopefully have their own pathways as well to being leaders? The topic of our panel discussion is again surrounding the passion of Mary Cardwell yes. Dawson, who we spoke about just a, a moment. But again, this is a, a month-long seminar, is yes. it not? I mean, <laughs> with multiple participants. So it's a big topic, and this is a free get-together. Yep. Uh, academics and uh, newbies, all mm -hmm. sorts of folks would find this a fascinating discussion. Yeah, and I think what's great too is, it, again, whatever you're interested in, if, if opera may not be your thing, which, you know, there are some people out there, and I, I know they exist, that opera is not their thing. They call me on Saturday afternoons <laughs> when the Mets sure. on. <laughs> This panel is going to have a little bit of something for everybody. So if you love fashion, we have a costume designer. If you love the theater and if you love arts and like in that respect and storytelling, we've got Shonda there. If you like more of the choral or the academia perspective, we've got Thomas there. So you can come for whatever that entry point is for you that feels most comfortable to see how it all comes together in the end. Uh, so I think this is great for anybody, for emerging leaders in the arts, for people that are in school, for people that just want to come and see how the arts combine. Uh, and yes, we're going to have a little reception after this one as well. So you want to come down just for some snacks and for some drinks. We're going to have that after this uh, in addition to this great panel. And like I said, it's free. And you are not underlining the beautiful contribution of the work that you do at Pittsburgh Opera <laughs> of bringing people together through diversity. We are talking about being a more harmonious world here. It's going to be fabulous. The mood should be uplifting, I think. I think so, too. Yeah. My, you know, my motto here is, is all about inclusion. And when we think about true inclusion, that means that there is a seat for everybody at the table. We're not looking at one demographic or one particular type of person. We want everyone to come and to see where our similarities really exist. We all have similarities that we, we, can't, we can't see right away, but if we take the time to talk to each other, and that's why so much of these events have time built into them for just meeting each other and talking and having that moment of shared community, because that's how we start to see where we connect and how we bridge that difference between who we are as people. I don't do politics well myself because <laughs> I'm in the arts, but it, it breaks my heart that sometimes diversion and inclusion becomes a political mm -hmm. discussion. You're in the house of Fred Rogers. <laughs> We're supposed to love what you, love one another, <laughs> Rebecca Diaz. Yeah. So that isn't that really what it's all about? It is, and I understand about the political um, issues centering around DEI right now. Um, one thing that we forget, though, is that DEI, at its actual original intention, was about connection. It was only about connection. And I think in the recent uh, times, it's gotten a little bit of, of pull in certain areas about more derision and more division between people. But truly, the 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 actual mission of DEI is to connect. How can we connect? Where can we bring more people in? How can we find our similarities? And that's what we try to do with it. Are you hopeful at this point? 
I'm always hopeful. I'm a pretty hopeful person. That makes two of us. Yeah, for better or for worse, you know, if you don't have hope, what have you got? So I'm hopeful. Who would have guessed that we'd have fire shot up in my bones yes. on stage? It was a huge hit. It's back again. He's working on another one. I think that's a hopeful sign for sure. Terrence oh, Blanchard's absolutely. opera yeah. at the Metropolitan. And there are a lot of other signs like that. Your resident artists at Pittsburgh Opera are, in fact, a pretty diverse bunch. We've got a very diverse bunch in terms of, of you know, both their ethnic background, in terms of their orientation, in terms of their gender. We've got a really, really nice, robust uh, people. We've got some more coming in for the next season, too. A whole new group of resident artists coming in that are just as diverse. Um, and the reason that's good, you know, we always, we don't want diverse for diversity's sake. We want that because the more diverse people we have, whatever that means, we have more diversity of thought. And that gives different perspectives and we all learn different things and we grow and we have more fun in the process by learning different things that we may not know about ourselves. Pittsburghers do like to show their pride for their team, yes. for their Steelers. Mm -hmm. Even when the Pirates lose, we're still behind them all, <laughs> all the way. But Mary Carr well, Dawson, we've got to take pride in her contribution. Yes, yes. And I think that's happening now. I think we're starting to see a, a really wonderful influx of attention to what she did and who she was as a, as a person here in Pittsburgh and just the great lion's share of work she did to connect everybody and to give access to those, uh, those that wanted it for the arts. How are you uh, feeling about the ho hope of uh, Ms. Solomon to get the house together? Are they gonna, it's a huge fundraising problem. It certainly is, but I don't think that Janae will ever stop. I think that she'll be fundraising for that house until it happens or until she <laughs> she's no longer with us. But she's extraordinarily dedicated to making sure that that house um, becomes what it used to be. And I know that she's on the way. She's on the way. Certainly now she's secured the foundation. You can actually enter the house without it collapsing on you, and that's a huge step already. So I know that she will not give up until that house is very workable and, and very enterable. You're very focused on these special events, but the opera itself, The Passion of Mary Cardwell Dawson, what can you share about the opera and the happenings around it directly? Yes. The, the performances are almost here. They are almost here. So the, the performances are going to be on April 27th and 30th, and then also on May 3rd and 5th. And what I think, again, is really unique about this opera is you can't even really call it a true opera. It's actually a play um, with opera music in it. So it's another really great entry point for those that may be a little nervous about sitting through a full, you know, long three hour opera. This is only an hour long. Um, it's got a lot of very famous uh, opera pieces that we've all known and love. A lot of Carmen is in it. Um, and that's because the basis of this opera is that Mary Carwell Dawson is working with a bunch of her singers, teaching them the opera Carmen, and they're about to put this performance on. However, she runs into a big issue where she's not able any longer to use the venue. Um, because of segregation. She refuses to segregate her audiences. And so the opera really focuses on the duality of these young singers wanting to perform so desperately, but Mary Carwell Dawson really sticking to her guns about how segregation just is not the place to start this in the arts. And so you've got to come to the opera and find out what happens in the end. Have you, you're from New York, right? I am from New York, Have yes. you fully immersed yourself in Pittsburgh and the world of Mary Car Carville Dawson <laughs> in that time, thinking about the Hill District, thinking about the new Granada, the Granada Theater, and uh, oh, all of the clubs where jazz, there's yeah. Ellington, everybody, have you read Smoketown, have you yes. ch checked out? <laughs> I mean, it was such a rich, culturally diverse world. Absolutely, and I love Pittsburgh. I, I've, I've always been in love with Pittsburgh since I went to school here, and um, we do such a wonderful, robust history. It's amazing to think about how much arts and culture and history we have packed in such a small little area here, uh, you know, in, in Western Pennsylvania. And uh, we really should be very proud of all that we have to offer. And you can't turn a stone here without finding some amazing historical significance in Pittsburgh. It's wonderful. Yeah. I, I think of the house and how they had yes. people staying overnight there that were world-class figures. There were figures. so many, yeah. There was Roberto Clemente was staying there. And of course, um, uh, oh my gosh, and not, what's her name? The singer. I forgot her name. Ah, Lena Horne. Lena, Lena Horne Horn was there oh as my. well. Yeah, it became a really great boarding house for a lot of, um, you know, black performers and black professionals that could not stay somewhere else in Pittsburgh. So we had these luminaries just streaming through the Homewood area. Rebecca Diaz, you're one of those luminaries now. I no. want to know more <laughs> about you. You went to CMU. You worked with Mimi Lerner. You yes. were at uh, Manhattan School of Music. What else uh, haven't we mentioned that shaped you and brought you to this oh spot? Oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah, so I was a performer for quite a while. I was I was very fortunate to get to work with Mimi Lerner while here at uh, Carnegie Mellon in, in Pittsburgh. She was a phenomenal person that truly was probably the catalyst from where my life is now. Mimi was all about helping others. Uh, that was her big motto is that, you know, you need to help those that need help behind you, and that's your purpose. And I really took that to heart. Uh, so yes, went to Manhattan School of Music, uh, performed opera for quite a while, um, for maybe a good 10 years before I decided to retire to doing more civic practice in the arts and finding ways for people to really figure out the pathways that they can they can use to utilize opera or the performing arts in general to kind of get 
to that next stage of their life, which is which is where I got to. I'm very thankful that the arts kind of catapulted me into a world that I may have not otherwise had access to. What else should we share about these two events? And I, I want you to come back as soon as possible oh, so that we can fun. talk further about anything you're involved in because it has an energy and excitement about yeah, it. Yeah, so it, like I, sh I should mention that these events are part of a series of other few events that we've been doing to get everyone excited about Mary Carvel Dawson. Um, we have finished one up that was uh, also in Homewood. It was a family event where we focused on a lot of the elements that go into creating opera, uh, a lot of hands-on activities for families to see how do you make props for opera, how do you uh, create a costume for an opera and design that. Um, how do you learn about the music in opera? How do you learn about stage makeup in opera? Um, and all that kind of came together in a great little performance where we showed all those elements come together on the stage to get those families excited about it. We're working on another event um, that is almost ready to, to speak about a little more broadly, which is a storytelling event where we're kind of combining the story of Janae Solomon finding the house with some stories of those that knew Mary Carvel Dawson in her lifetime, with her sister telling some stories about things that they had growing up as children, uh, Peggy Freeman, who was a pianist of hers, um, and that That'll be a really great event coming up too. So if you miss any of these, we'll have a few others coming to support this opera. And if you miss all of those, just come to the opera anyway, because it'll be a wonderful experience. We'll have a really great lobby display set up at the Biome um, that comes from the Denise Grace Foundation. You don't want to miss that, even if you don't come to the opera. It's a really great uh, experience with all these costumes from the time period and some really neat uh, historical significant displays to check out. So we've got really a lot going on to make this a very immersive experience. And if I completely uh, bewildered about how to begin, what do I do? Do I go to your website? Can I call somebody? What you do I... can do any and all of those. Go to our website. If you go to pittsburghopera.com, we have all the events listed right there on our website. We've got a rolling screen uh, on that landing page where you can kind of just click on the one you want to come see. We have an events calendar on there. You can always just call up the opera directly, and they'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, yeah, that's probably your best bet. And Rebecca, what, what drives you? What pushes you to do all this great work? You've had the excitement of being on stage, <laughs> and that's thrilling and makes everything in the body tingle. But uh, now you're doing this wonderful work. Have you been able to analyze uh, <laughs> your, your own personal direction and what's happening? Yeah, for sure. You know, for me, it's all about curiosity. I, I really live my life in a very curious mindset. Um, and because of that, I'm genuinely curious about all the people I meet. Uh, I really want to know what makes people tick. I really want to know what people enjoy and what makes them excited about things and to see how we can connect that. I like to think of myself as a connector um, and whatever that means, if that means connecting individuals or art forms or partnerships or whatever that is, I think that's how we find joy in life. That's how we find interesting things that happen to you every day. But I like to leave with curiosity and it keeps things interesting. Well said. We are totally <laughs> linked arm in arm with that. Classical music, radio, it has that pace, that stamp of elitism. And we try every day to avoid giving that mm -hmm. but sometimes you know it's codes that you send out you don't realize sometimes you speak a certain language I think uh, I came my grandfather was a minister I came from the religious world they also do that too where they sure. start speaking in, in a kind of <laughs> secret code help us break down these barriers if we want everyone to enjoy what we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I come from the Bronx originally. I'm from the Bronx, New York, and we definitely grew up, you know, on the other side of the tracks, you know, to put it mildly. And it, I was lucky enough to have a lot of influence um, in the classical arts that did break that down for me, that did give me that that access. And it was always such a lovely surprise as a young person to enter into these, these beautiful buildings, these big performing arts spaces and museums, and never have anyone say, oh, get out of here, kid, you don't belong here. It was always such a welcoming experience. And I think if we continue to do that for others, you know, if we have that knowledge and we're not gatekeeping it, if we're being free with it and we're making it as normal as it can be for everyone else around, that's how we start to break down those barriers and make it very accessible for everyone. Rebecca Diaz, you have lifted me. <laughs> Thank you for coming by today. My absolute pleasure. It's been really lovely speaking with you. All the best for these events and anything you're doing in the future, give us a ring. We'll try Absolutely. to help you get yeah. the megaphone going. That's great. Thank you so much. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Spirit Rise. Spirit Rise.